and is a principal investigator on one of the GSET projects, which is entitled Nature Inspired Solid State Electric Catalysis, Catalyst, the Oxidation of Water and Reduction of CO2 to Fuels. So you can see why we've chosen uh, the topic that we have today uh, for his tutorial. Um, uh, Professor Jan Milo, um, he, he is a Stanford grad. He got his Bachelor's of Science degree in Chemical Engineering from Stanford and then went on to the University of California at Santa Barbara, where he earned his MS and PhD degrees in Chemical Engineering and then uh, went as a postdoctoral research researcher to the Technical University of Denmark in the Department of Physics. He's won um, a number of research awards, including the um, NSF Career Award, the More, D More Davido Ventures Innovator Award, and the Hellman Faculty Scholar Award. Um, most recently, um, he was uh, honored with the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers for his innovations in solar hydrogen production. And he, was, um, he received this award, actually, in a ceremony from the president. And it's one of the highest honors, it's the highest honor bestowed by the US government on scientists and engineers early in their independent research careers. So we're delighted to have Tom uh, to um, give this tutorial today, and he'll be doing it on Electrocatalysis 101. Great, thank you very much, Richard, for the very kind introduction, and also for the opportunity to uh, educate uh, the audience on the field of electrocatalysis. I think it's a field that, it's been around for a long, long time, there's no doubt about that, but I think there's a, a reinvigoration of this field because there's a lot of very interesting chemistry that happens at the electrochemical interface that has relevance to energy. So I think this fits very well within GSEP and fits very well into future possibilities for where we might go with our energy infrastructure down the line. What I'd like to do to start uh, today's class or lecture is to, uh, to kind of pull the audience to see, um, it, because I've designed this tutorial really to, to reach out um, at the most fundamental level and kind of build up so that everyone at the end of today will have a, a working knowledge of electrocatalysis. And I'd like to just see by a, ra by a show of hands, those of you who have taken at least one class uh, in chemistry at the collegiate level. If you have, please, please raise your hand. Okay, we'll start there, excellent. Um, next question is, who in this room has ever physically touched a potentiostat? Raise your hand. Okay, so it's about 50-50. So about half of you haven't, half of you had. This is a good place to start. So um, really, I'd like to, to bring this up um, again from the basics. And this is the outline for today's class. And I'd like to say that I've prepared about what I would say about 50 to 60 minutes of pres uh, presentation material. So as you know, this is a one and a half hour slot, so I've left plenty of time for discussion. Feel free to interrupt me at any time, and you can also, we'll have plenty of time hopefully at the end for questions too. So if, if there's something that's not clear, please just raise your hand and let me know. So this is the outline for the tutorial. We're gonna talk first just a general introduction to catalysis and electrocatalysis. And then I've divided up the fundamentals into really these areas. There's thermodynamics and kinetics, which are the two places you wanna start with any chemical reaction. We'll talk about methods a little bit, um, what you would need in your lab if you wanted to engage electrocatalysis research. And then we'll talk about something that I think is extremely important nowadays, and that is figures of merit for electrocatalyst development. At the end of the day, what do we want to do? We want to be able to rank catalysts and say this is better than that and, and why and how, but first you need some figures of merit to just say what, what is better, what, how are we going to define better? And so for those of you in the room who don't do electrochemistry research or electrocatalysis research, my goal is that at the end of today, that you can actually grab a scientific paper in the world of electrocatalysis and actually be able to just say, is this a good catalyst or not? Okay, be able to at least uh, interpret that. And those of you who are already in this field or in related fields, at the end of the day, hopefully um, you can grasp a strong framework by which to think about how to design a good catalyst, which is another layer of complexity. Okay, so those are the goals for today. And so we're gonna go over the fundamentals. So I'd say the bulk of my talk, maybe 80%, is on the area of, of the fundamentals, but then we're gonna um, end with the last 20% on applications, and we're gonna take everything that we learn up here and apply it to some real catalyst development challenges, okay? So that's the plan. So first, let's start with what is a catalyst? Can anyone in the audience define what a catalyst is for me, anybody? How would you define a catalyst? Anyone, yes? Yeah, so if, if the substance accelerates a reaction without being consumed. 
Perfect. It accelerates a reaction without being consumed. So here's Merriam-Webster's definition. In fact, it's a substance that enables a chemical reaction to proceed at a usually faster rate or under different conditions like lower temperature. Um, interestingly, Merriam-Webster also mentions that a catalyst is an agent that provokes or speeds significant change or action. So I kind of like this definition because I think those of us who work in catalysis, um, we can also define, describe ourselves as working in number two because we're trying to cause change, hopefully in a positive way. And the typical picture that is used to describe a catalyst, and this is not just electrocatalysis, this is any catalyst. We can think about you have a chemical reaction, A plus B going to AB, and this is the conventional way of looking at it that without a catalyst you have to overcome some huge uh, energy gain before it can go back downhill and, and make the final product. A plus B wants to go to AB, but it has this barrier that it must surmount, and with a good catalyst you can lower this activation energy. So this is the conventional picture, but there's a lot more to it than that and we'll talk about that later on. Um, I, I like to also start by just kind of putting electrocatalysis within the context of how I view the entire field of catalysis, because catalysis means different things to different people. And so just in, in my studies, I've kind of come across or I've kind of synthesized all of catalysis research to really fit into one of five camps, and I thought that might be interesting to share. On one extreme, there's biocatalysts, and these are enzymes. These are things that are in our body right now, digesting the, the cinnabons that are sitting outside. Uh, in, the, in the lobby, and these are obviously a very important class of catalysts. Um, they, uh, one common example would be, say, water oxidation and photosynthesis. We all know that plants spit out O2. Okay? They do that. They get it from water. And how do they work? By proton and electron transfers. They work at ambient temperature, ambient pressure, and in liquid environment, aqueous systems, usually. Now, the polar extreme in my world from a biocatalyst would be ultra-high vacuum surface science. Okay, so this is people who work in that field also work in catalysis. They would say they work in catalysis. They would take a very well-defined surface, a single crystal like a ruthenium-109 cut crystal, and it's very fundamental studies of adsorption, desorption, reaction. You're throwing molecules at it. You're watching them land. You're seeing how strongly they stick. You, you watch them move. They pop off the surface. But these types of, of uh, catalysts or these types of surfaces are studied in ultra-high vacuum, which usually means uh, it's very, very low pressures. We're talking about one trillionth of an atmosphere, okay, which is really low pressures, um, very well controlled system. So whereas this is a big macromolecule uh, that has a very well, or sorry, has an active site that's buried in there somewhere that is very poorly defined, it's, it's a huge challenge to figure out what the active site of an enzyme looks like, much less how it works. This is the extreme where we have a very well-defined surface and can get much better information, but then it's operating at some conditions that aren't necessarily relevant, whereas we know these things work in, in the real world. Um, if we move one step to the right from the biocatalyst, you would have homogeneous catalysts. So this is a typically what an inorganic chemist would be working on, some transition metal center with some set of ligands that put electrons into that transition metal, withdraw electrons. You can do lots of catalysis in a homogeneous phase. A common example would be synthesis of fine chemicals, um, olefin metathesis, large-scale industrial processes, many of which are based on, on homogeneous catalysts. They have a lot in common with the enzymes. In the end of the, at the end of the day, an enzyme has an active site that looks in something not too different from, from that. It's basically organic ligands, again, with transition metals in somewhere. Um, the difference is that here, these are, are much better defined systems because one can synthesize them and know exactly what one makes. If we go one step from this direction, from a, a well-defined surface here, then you have a more conventional, again, very industrial scale type of catalyst. These are nanoparticles that are oftentimes uh, metals that are loaded onto metal oxide surfaces. These are much less defined than, than these very well-defined single crystals because they're nanoparticles, they morph a lot, they have different sizes and shapes. It's really a, not as easy of a question to say what's the active site in that catalyst, but this is really a, a major player in the catalysis industry, doing a lot of important reactions, catalytic converters just being one of them. Another huge one is ammonia synthesis. Okay? Catalysts there feed the world okay? because there's not enough just ammonia out there. Naturally, you have to create that ammonia by taking nitrogen and hydrogen and reacting them together to make NH3 and ultimately fertilizer. So, but they work by the same method, these two, they're thermochemical reactions, um, a broad range of temperatures, wide range of pressures, and this could be gas or liquid phase. And then me, in my biased view, will put electrocatalysis <laughs> right in the center. And the reason why, the way I kind of came up with this scheme in the first place, actually, is because as we do a lot of research in this area, I kind of realized that, that I was reading a lot of literature here and here that helped me figure out how to design a better catalyst there. 
And then that gave me this realization that, wow, um, electric catalysis really has a lot in common. On the one hand, it's a lot of times surfaces, like say platinum nanoparticles in a fuel cell, that have a lot in common with this type of surface or with this type of surface. But it works by proton and electron transfers, very much like these catalysts over here. And it's in an aqueous environment, and so it's, there's just a lot in common with both legs of, or both sides of this, of this picture. Yes? Yeah. So, excellent. Yeah. So, so I would say, so great. Thank you for bringing up the question. The question is, what, what about photocatalysis? So um, what I would say is that these are my, my five general camps, and I think every field of catalysis that I've ever seen or recognized, I can either fit cleanly into one of these or at the interface somehow. So where does, where does photocatalysis come in? So let's, let's drill down into electrocatalysis. And I would actually put photocatalysis as part of electrocatalysis. Um, and I'll explain why in, in a moment. Um, let's talk about one way to do electrocatalysis is you can actually take the very same inorganic complexes that I was showing you on the previous slide in homogeneous catalysis, put that in a beaker and, and have that impinge on an electrode and do electron transfer reactions. So here's one example uh, published by a new faculty member here at Stanford, Hema. She's in the chemistry department. You can have surface electrocatalysts, as I mentioned, you can take either single crystals or you can take nanoparticles and basically do Again, on a, it's like surface electrochemistry, but you're using proton and electron transfers instead of thermochemistry to drive a reaction. And then in photocatalysis, you're shining light onto a semiconductor that absorbs that light. You create electrons and holes, and those electrons and holes ultimately do go to an interface and do electrocatalysis. So in, in this type of scheme, it's exactly everything that you know that happens in electrocatalysis in the dark will also occur in a photocatalyst, but then you add a whole lot more complexity because now you're doing a photon absorption process with, again, electron hole pair excitation, um, separation, charge transport, and the goal is can you design semiconductors where you can get those electrons and holes right at the interface where then the electrocatalyst can do its job and do the electron transfer. Okay, so this is, so this is I would put a subset within the general domain of electrocatalysis. All right, so let's take a look at some examples. Here are three electrochemical reactions that one might be interested to, in catalyzing. There's many examples out there. But I picked these three because they're very important energy conversion reactions. And within the context of GSEP, these are very important reactions that GSEP has, has historically funded because there are big challenges and big needs in these areas. So as you can see, one example here is making hydrogen. So you take two protons plus two electrons, you make molecular H2. You could also take carbon dioxide, and instead of making H2, you might want to stick those protons and electrons onto CO2 to make some organic molecules. You can make hydrocarbons, you can make alcohols, you can make uh, ketones, you make aldehydes, lots of different possibilities there that could be either used as chemicals in the chemical industry or as fuels. And then you might ask yourself, well, if I, where am I going to get these protons and electrons? Because you don't just walk around and find a pool of protons and electrons lying around. You've got to get them from somewhere. And the pool that you do find is, let's say, water which you could then oxidize to molecular O2, releasing protons and electrons that can then be used in this reaction. Okay, so if we read all these reactions from left to right, this is the fuel production direction. Okay, so we need to, when you're producing fuels, you need to put energy in. You can imagine a device like an electrolyzer that you basically put in solar electricity or wind electricity or geothermal electricity, some renewable form of electricity to drive these reactions to make the things that you want. Or you can imagine an all-in-one type of device, like the one that my PhD student, Jabot, had drawn. And you can shine light onto a semiconductor that's immersed in water. It looks much like a panel, uh, like a photovoltaics panel, but it's immersed in water. And you can either do water splitting directly to make H2NO2, or you could feed in carbon dioxide and do a reduction reaction to make things like methanol. Okay, so left to right, this is a fuel production direction. Notice that there are double-headed arrows, so you can go back the other way, which you want to do because you need to get that energy back out. So we're gonna use renewable energy to make the fuels, and then to consume the fuels, you can either, be sure, you can put it into an internal combustion engine and just get the energy back out like we normally would, but uh, you may be aware that fuel cells are, can be much more efficient than internal combustion engines. And so the point is we could feed these same fuels, be it hydrogen, uh, be it hydrocarbons, be it alcohols, et cetera. We can just do exactly the same chemistry in the other direction. And since we needed energy input to go left to right, that means we'll get energy out if we go right to left. Okay, so these are three very conventional um, electrochemical reactions that one looks to catalyze. The, the point is the better the catalyst that you make, 
the less energy input you need to go left to right, and the more energy you get out when you go right to left. That's one of the principal goals of catalysis in this scheme. All right. So let's talk about some key terms in electrochemistry. And this is one of the most important uh, jargon that, that you need to internalize to understand anything electrochemistry related, be it catalysis or batteries or anything else. And, <clears throat> and the very first is answering the question is, what is oxidation? What is reduction? So let's, let's get some nice crisp definitions that we can all remember. So losing electrons is oxidation. Gaining electrons is reduction. And so the mnemonic to remember is Leo the lion goes grr. Okay, that's how you remember what's oxidation and what's reduction. Now this is really important to know because in electrochemistry, we talk about anodes and cathodes, and this is very confusing. Even people who work in the field for years, even myself, you know, sometimes I have to look, just take a step back and be like, wait, what's the anode, what's the cathode? It's very important to know what your anode and your cathode are, and the worst thing you can do is think of it as in terms of what's plus and what's minus. Okay, that'll only get you in trouble. And that's because it depends on the type of device if you're putting energy in or getting energy out. And so the right way to think about it is that reduction always happens at the cathode. You cannot go wrong with that definition. So the mnemonic to remember is just think of a red cat. Okay, a red cat by the name of Leo that goes grr. <laughs> okay, now let's talk about some thermodynamics. All right, this is, we're gonna take uh, the framework that everybody learned in high school Yes, sir. This is just a real sure. Point, but I remember from general chemistry, uh, uh, cathode, uh, the electrodes are named after the anti ions that like to migrate. Mm -hmm. Is that a useful? Thing? That's a very useful way, yeah. So it's, it's called a cathode because cations move towards it. Um, and and the, the idea is if it's a cation that has a positive charge, and guess what you're going to do? You're going to reduce it, OK? So, but you know, bear in mind that sometimes, um, sometimes you can have a, a cation that gets oxidized to a further oxidation state too. So then it can get confusing. But that's, you're absolutely right. That's where the names anode and cathode came from. In fact, that was Michael Faraday, I believe, is the one who introduced that concept. And this was in the 1830s. And we should all know that, by the way, electrochemistry is a very old field, okay? As, as much as there's so much interest right now in terms of electrochemical energy conversion technologies, the first fuel cells, and batteries, they're 200 years old. These are the early 1800s when these things were developed. And then uh, again, in the early 1800s, 1830-ish uh, is when Michael Faraday came up with all his laws and really set up the, the framework by which we view electrochemistry. So this is not new science, although we're utilizing the tools that we have today to push the field further ahead. The, the basics haven't changed for over a century. So getting back to thermodynamics, I like to start with a framework, basically converting the things that we learned in high school and converting those, that thermochemistry to electrochemistry lingo. And so let's say I take that same reaction we talked about on slide one of A plus B going to AB, and let's say that has a delta G of minus 100 kilojoules per mole, so a spontaneous reaction. So we can write exactly the same reaction as an electrochemical reaction, but we're gonna have to write it as two electrochemical reactions because we need to cancel out electrons. You need, a, in other words, you need a reduction and an oxidation to happen simultaneously such that you don't, you don't have, leave any uh, electrons in the balance. So you can write A goes to A plus plus E minus, that's an oxidation, it's just A it just lost its electron. And you can write B plus A plus plus E minus goes to AB, which is a reduction reaction. And each of these two reactions is going to have what we call an equilibrium potential, okay, which is generally denoted E naught under standard conditions. So we'll call this E1 naught, E2 naught. You sum up these two things, you get exactly the same reaction. Therefore, you have to get exactly the same delta G, minus 100 kilojoules per mole. But now what we can do is we can translate that into more electrochemistry lingo because it turns out that delta G can be written out as minus NFE, where N is the number of electrons transferred in the overall reaction, which is one in this case. F is a nice convenient constant, Faraday's constant, 96,485 coulombs per mole. And then there's this E, this is what we call the cell potential. Okay, it can be written out as E naught cell or delta E naught, and this can be confusing. And so this is, I'm going to dedicate a slide, a couple of slides to, to basically figure out what this means and, and what it represents. So let's talk about these, these E naughts. What are these E naughts? So you can grab a lot of references that can grab a CRC, go online. Um, 
Web, websites galore, uh, all kinds of handbooks have the electrochemical series. Any physical chemistry textbook will have this. And what it is is a list of a number of different electrochemical reactions. These are all half reactions. Okay? They're not balanced. You're basically sticking an electron onto lithium plus to make lithium metal, or onto potassium, or onto magnesium, or onto copper, et cetera, et cetera. And so we call this electrochemical series. Note that every single one of these reactions has a voltage associated with it. And what this voltage is ultimately telling us is how negative or how positive, how, let's think of it negative, how negative does that electron have to be to actually stick it onto lithium plus? Okay? And it's ranked in an order of difficulty in the sense that lithium, we know that lithium zero, lithium is an alkali metal. We know that lithium does not want to have that extra electron around because if it gets rid of it, it has a nice closed shell. Same with potassium. So that means that this electron must be really, really negative for you to peg it onto lithium plus to actually make lithium metal. Okay, so this is why it's the most negative of all these potentials on the table at minus three volts. We can consi consider that a really high negative electron energy. It's also why it's such a good reducing agent. Okay, reducing agent means that if you have lithium metal and you put that into solution, it's going to want to give up its electrons like crazy to form lithium plus, which means it's very strong, a good reducing agent to reduce anything else that's in the system. Okay? On the other side of the table down below, then we have, oppositely, the strongest oxidizing agents. These are species that want to grab electrons. So then you have something, a noble metal like silver does not want to be in a silver one plus state. It really wants electrons. So if you put silver plus in solution, it's going to want to pluck electrons from someplace and, and metallize. Okay? So if you throw, throw lithium metal in solution with Silver plus, there's going to be massive electron transfer where, where lithium is pumping those electrons into silver. So this is this is the the most this is kind of the first place to look if you're doing anything electrochemistry is what are the equilibrium potentials involved. This is how we this is our way of talking thermodynamics in electrochemistry. I also want to point out that these voltage values you see here are completely arbitrary. They're completely arbitrary. Why is that? Because in this particular table they've chosen to define this reaction as being zero volts. And so they, they, everything is relative to it. And you could have chosen anything. You could have chosen uh, iron 3 uh, plus, go, plus 3 electrons going to iron metal at minus 0 0.02 volts. We could have converted that to zero or converted sodium to zero. Okay? You can reference. That's one of the convenient things about electrochemistry is you can, you can choose any reaction to be your reference. And this actually manifests itself uh, in a very important way, when you're running an experiment, this is what we call a reference electrode that's sticking inside your cell. And there's one of these reactions going on. And we're going to reference all our voltages that we measure in our potentiostat to that particular equilibrium potential. OK, hope. Yes? So if, if there is, if we wanted to set an absolute scale, this is a great question. The absolute scale that is oftentimes preferred, or at least for me, is the vacuum scale. Okay, because we know what is the energy of an electron just you know flying, zooming in the continuum. And so this is like so in other words, in, in vacuum. And what's and, and this is not a very hard number. There's a lot of wiggle room here because this is not perfectly defined, but this is a convention in, in the literature that the standard hydrogen electrode, which is by definition this reaction, so a lot of times this becomes the zero value, the reference point on a relative scale. Uh, the vacuum scale is 4.44 volts above that. Okay, so this is kind of, if you wanted to put it on an absolute scale, that would be one way that you could do it. But again, there's, this is not a very hard number. It's, you know, different people measure different things, and it's, not, it's really an impossible experiment. But there's experiments that can approach that, and there's a lot of theory that calculates things. So typical values are between, I'd say, about 4.2 and 5.0, to give you an idea. Yes? Sure, sure. I need something. Uh, this, this may be a stupid question, but on the other hand, no stupid questions. You're absolutely right. So if I've got a, a bunch of hydrogen ions floating around, mm -hmm. and I've got some electrons, mm -hmm. how do I determine that? I mean, the electrons are going to want to fall into the hydrogen and, and find out. How do I determine how much energy I get out of them? 
having these electrons fall in it. Do I need to go to the vacuum uh, uh, potential and then reference to the to the hyd to that hydrogen electron? So, so if you have a device that you're looking to get energy out, and this is exactly what a fuel cell does. So a fuel cell takes hydrogen and it oxidizes it to protons and electrons. And then those protons uh, move through the membrane and electrons go around the circuit. And then there needs to be another reaction happening to balance things out. So the way I just described it, we just oxidize hydrogen, which means on the other side of the cell, there must be a reduction reaction. And the voltage you get out of your device isn't you can't just consider just this equation. You have to consider what's the other equation. What's the balancing reduction reaction? And in, in a fuel cell, the typical reduction reaction is reducing O2. So going from O2, sticking those protons and electrons onto that to make H2 at 1.23 volts. So we're going to go through an exercise to calculate this type, exactly this type of thing. But the point is, in a perfect fuel cell, we're operating at room temperature under standard conditions, because all these values are listed at standard conditions, then you would get 1.23 volts out. But that's under ideal conditions. And then, as we'll talk about in a moment, these are all purely thermodynamics, which means we haven't talked about rate or kinetics at all. So the more, the more current you want to flow through your system, you're going to have to pay a penalty. So then your voltage is going to keep shrinking and shrinking as you, as you push the, the current. Yes, sir, in the back. We have a couple of examples that are multi-valent ions with ions with multiple electrons. That's right. Is it actually really sequential, and that's the sum of multiple steps? Or should I think of that as all three of these? Electrons yeah, so this is, again, thermodynamics. So it's just considering initial and final states. So it's not considering the pathway to get there at all, which could absolutely change the game in terms of what your voltage out of your system is, because there might be one kind of rate-determining step or rate-determining electron, if you want to think of it that way. But right now, it's all just thermodynamics, so initial and final. So to calculate cell potentials for devices like fuel cells or batteries, uh, we need to take advantage of what I just showed you on the table. So to be instructive about it, I'm going to use the Statue of Liberty as an example. And uh, as we know, Statue of Liberty is, uh, you know, she's well over 100 by this point. When she first arrived to, to the US, this is what she looked like. You know, she's made of copper on the outside. She had a nice copper sheen. But we know that she hasn't looked like that for a really long time. And we know that that's because of corrosion. Okay, not, not unsuspected in this salty environment of the Atlantic. You know, eventually she corroded and, and formed this you know, interesting copper oxide layer that has this interesting metallic green color. But uh, that's not what we're going to talk about here in terms of corrosion, which is an electrochemical process, by the way. What I'd like to point out is that it turns out many of you in the room might remember that um, around her, when she turned 100 years old, she was actually covered in scaffolding for a couple of years. I remember that when I was growing up. And um, it looked really ugly to me, but I didn't know why. And it turns out that, so she's got iron on the inside. The scaffold is made of iron. They didn't want to make that of copper. It's too soft of a metal. And by the, in the late 1800s, when they built the Statue of Liberty, they knew very well that there could be some corrosion happening where the copper oxide would basically cause an oxidation of the iron. And so they shielded it. They insulated it. And uh, they used the best insulation you can find in the late 1800s, which worked fine for a while. But after about 100 years, they realized that, oh my gosh, she's losing her structural integrity because of the corrosion of the iron on the inside. So there were some shorts where the metals were coming in contact with each other. And so the whole scaffolding idea was to remove that old insulation and put in things like Teflon, which are much, much better at, uh, at insulating, much more robust. So let's calculate this. Let's figure this out. Let's, uh, let's pretend that we were. Uh, the folks who built the Statue of Liberty in France in the 1800s to see would there be a problem. And so how do you figure this out? So step one is you identify the relevant redox reactions. So we said she's made of copper. And, um, and the question is, will the iron on the inside turn to rust, which is Fe2O3? So I've literally plucked these exact same two equations from the other table. And these are the E1 and E2 as listed, okay, minus 0 0.02 and plus 0.34. Step two is you need to choose one. The question, we want to figure out, will one oxidize the other? So we need to choose one of these reactions to be an oxidation and one to be a reduction. They're both written as reduction reactions. If we added them up as is, we would have five electrons floating around. We don't want to do that. We need to get them to cancel out. So we need to choose one reaction to be a reduction and one in our, uh, uh, an oxidation. And at this point, it's a total arbitrary decision. Let's just choose one react the first reaction. Let's choose this to be the oxidation. So what's step three? Okay, now to calculate a cell potential, we calculate E cathode minus E anode. 
And we said that reaction two was going to be as written, which is a reduction reaction. So that's going to be our cathode. We said that we're going to make this deoxidation. So this is going to be our anode. So I literally just plug in the same values from up here, and we get plus 0.36 volts. Now what do we do? We can use this delta G equals minus NFE equation. Let's balance the equation first. So we write out, so let's, if, if this were moving instead of left to right, right to left, um, we add up the equations, and this is what we get. And when we balance it out, we see that there's three electrons transferred. So we just put de delta G equals minus N, which is three, F, which is Faraday's constant, and E, which is that E cell that we got from up here at plus 0.36. We plug in the numbers, we, what do we get as an answer? Minus 104.2 kilojoules per mole. What's the, what's the meaning of all this? We got a negative number, which means that it's a spontaneous reaction as we had defined it, with this being the oxidation and this being the reduction. What does that mean? That means that, in fact, if you had copper 2 plus sitting around next to iron 0, that copper is going to want to pluck those electrons from the iron and oxidize it. And this is why it's important to have that insulation. I also want to point out that had we, I mentioned that this was an arbitrary decision to choose what's the oxidation, what's the reduction. Had we chosen the opposite, then we would just end up with a positive number here, which would have been a delta G being positive in uphill, and we would have said, oh, okay, so clearly in, in real life, this would end up getting oxidized, not this. Okay, so either way you would have done it, the calculation teaches us what's the, how the thermodynamics go. Could we just have a vote and change the sign convention? <laughs> <laughs> so much easier. So what? How would you? How would you want to change it? How would you? Make the opposite. Make delta G and FE. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Don't have to worry about the <laughs> so there's there's no reason why one couldn't, <laughs> but yeah, it, it all comes down to how things are, are really tabulated. Sure. So, but yeah, I mean. Be yeah. Was... Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> It, it, it was an arbitrary choice. Yep. OK. So now let's talk about thermodynamics. So now that, that was an example just to give you an idea of how to think about adding up a reduction and an oxidation and figuring out, is it downhill? Do you, get, do you have to put energy in? Is it energy out? Now let's start applying that knowledge to reactions that we might care more about today, which is for energy conversion. So here's the same two protons plus two electrons going to H2. Again, this is on a reversible hydrogen electrode scale. Reversible hydrogen means that this is operating in equilibrium backwards and forwards. By definition, we're going to call that zero. And then here are a number of reactions uh, that we might care about. Again, sticking protons and electrons, instead of making H2, imagine sticking them onto CO2 to make value-added products, be it carbon monoxide or alcohols or hydrocarbons. The thing I want to point out here is that notice that all these CO2 reduction potentials they're all very similar to that of hydrogen, which means that if you give me protons and electrons of a certain chemical potential, it's just as much favorable to stick them onto CO2 to make these things as it is for them to recombine and make H2. So thermodynamically, it's exactly the same, you know, plus minus a very small amount, you know, 100 millivolts, which is nothing really. Um, so that's an important thing to bear in mind. But these are turned out to be much more difficult reactions to catalyze, to electrocatalyze, because there's so many protons and electrons. You got all these steps in the reaction, and the kinetics become really difficult. Whereas this is about as simple as a reaction can get. And then notice here is, is the O2 H2O equilibrium potential at plus 1.23 volts. So how do we think about this? Let's let's draw a diagram. We're gonna when we do electrochemistry, the the workhorse is plotting current or current density per square centimeter of your electrode versus potential. And that potential, we have to reference it to some scale. So sometimes it's plotted voltage versus RHE, the reversible hydrogen electrode. Or sometimes it's versus a silver-silver chloride redox couple, which is a very common electrode, or a mercury-mercury oxide. There's, just, there's so many different reference electrodes out there. So you can actually run your experiment on anything you want and either plot your data versus that scale, or you can, you can shift the scale, as I mentioned, to, to, to reach RHE or something else that might be more convenient. So what we can do is we can plot these things up. So there's your redox potential for H plus and H2. There's O2 and H2O, and then here's all these for CO2 to fuels and chemicals. And the point I want to make is that if you grab the equilibrium, what, this, what these equilibrium potentials mean is that if I had an electrode and I stuck it in the bath you know, with water, let's say, 
and I want to do redox chemistry, um, let's just use O2 and H2O. If I'm holding my electrode at exactly plus 1.23 volts versus the reversible hydrogen electrode, then that means that if I have O2 in solution and water in solution, that electrode is going from H2O2 to H2O and H2O back to O2 at exactly the same rate. Okay, that's the definition of equilibrium. If I'm holding my electrode right at that potential. Now, if I move that potential a little bit to this side, then I'm going to favor a reduction reaction. And if I move it to that side, I'm going to favor oxidation. Okay, so that's how, that's how we, that's how we push the chemistry one direction or the other. It depends on where our electrode is sitting on the voltage scale versus on one side or the other. So as you move your electrode this way, this is, we can think of it as more and more negative. Those electrons become more and more negative, so it's more favorable to push the reduction side. Okay, that's the way to think about it. So this is all, again, purely thermodynamics, purely thermochemistry. But in the real devices, what we care about is voltage out and current out. Okay, and then, so we can't just think about thermo, we have to think about kinetics. So how do kinetics look? Here's some reaction kinetics. These are things that one might measure in a laboratory environment. So here are, are some chemistries between water, H2O, and O2. So again, if you had a catalyst, so let's, let's, have, let's pretend you have a piece of platinum sitting right at zero volts on this RHE scale. Then that means that you should, get, you should measure no current. You can't measure any current because you, you're making just as much hydrogen as you're oxidizing that hydrogen away, backwards and forwards at exactly the same rate. Now, if I take that platinum electrode and move it to the left and move it onto the negative side of things, to the cathodic side, I'm going to favor a reduction reaction. So voila, I start getting a negative current. Okay? And so let me, just, let me also zoom out for a moment and say that when I plot current vol versus voltage, I should also point out that there's no universal convention. Uh, as Bill was pointing out, some people like to plot negative on the left and positive on the right, and some positive on the right and negative on the left. And same with current. So in my convention, everything you're going to see is negative on the left on the voltage scale, and a downward current is a negative current, a, a reduction current. And then positive is oxidation for current, and positive on this side is anodic. Okay, so I go by what's, um, what's, no, what's called the European Convention which I think is a little bit more popular than the American convention, which would be the other way. But bear in mind that when you look at literature, you have to pay attention because people plot things different ways. OK, so now if you have platinum, platinum is a really good catalyst for hydrogen in both directions. It's very good at oxidizing hydrogen. It's very good at reducing protons to make H2. So this is what we call a reversible catalyst. As you can see, you, you have the current going right through the middle at 0 which is great. That means if you're, if you're sitting at equilibrium, you should get no net current. As soon as you move it just one tick to the right, boom, you get oxidation. One tick to the left, boom, you get reduction. That's what we want in a catalyst. On the other side, though, at the, at the O2H2O chemistry, it turns out that there's no perfect catalyst. There's no reversible catalyst, which means that you have to go cathodic, 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 and then finally you start doing some reduction of O2, this reaction you see right here. And then on the oxidation side, if you want to oxidize water, you got to keep pushing it to the right, keep pushing it anodic, 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 higher and higher voltages, and then finally you start getting some current out. Okay, so these are two different, two very different reactions to catalyze because of the kinetics. You would never guess this just from the thermodynamics. I also want to point out that you notice that there's some plateau regions that you're seeing here. These plateau regions are the manifestation of mass transfer entering into the picture. And so in a perfect world, you'd have a catalyst that just zooms up and zooms down. But in reality, at some point, you're going to hit mass transfer limitations. And so on this side of the coin, uh, you have hydrogen, for instance. If you're doing electrochemistry experiment with hydrogen, you're bubbling hydrogen in solution. It's solvating the hydrogen. There's only so much solubility of H2 in water. And so at some point, you're going to deplete that pretty quickly, and then it'll flatten out. You can't get any more current, even though you're cranking up the voltage because of mass transfer. On this side. Uh, you will get mass transfer at some point where you're cranking out so many bubbles that you can't bring water in, but usually those, those limitations are easier, are, are, are wider. You have a, a larger tolerance there because the mass transfer is not as bad as dealing with, say, 20 parts per million H2 in solution. Same thing here where in here you're reducing O2, you're bubbling O2 in solution. There's only so much solvated H2, so, so it'll, it'll flatten out at some point. And here's water oxidation. You're creating bubbles. And at some point you will hit diffusion limitations, but they'll be much higher up on the current scale. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm.
Uh, that's, that's right. right. Prove it up, the concentration in the sense of like, I'm giving the area another their, their potential. potential. Yeah. yeah. And so it should be an equilibrium to the right. Yeah, so actually, and, and that's a, on that note, we should also point out that these equilibrium potentials, again, are under standard conditions of one molar of protons and, you know, one atmosphere of H2. As soon as you start producing H2 or consuming protons at that interface, the equilibrium potential can change as a result. Okay, so just a, a quick note on catalysts. So again, platinum is a wonderful catalyst for the hydrogen electrochemistry. Hydrogenase is an interesting enzyme that uh, does uh, hydrogen evolution very efficiently in nature. And uh, for this chemistry here, the common catalysts that are used uh, for the, some of the best catalysts that are made for the oxygen reduction reaction are based on alloys of platinum and nickel. There's also an enzyme out there, lactase, that's very good at this reaction, but there's still over potentials, this is what we call it, this is a very important term to learn, over potential. How much extra potential do you need to put into the system to get the current density that you want? Notice that here you have to apply something somewhat significant. Here it's, it's very small. And then on the water oxidation side, ruthenium oxide is one of the best catalysts out there for making O2 from water, for oxidizing water. And then photosystem two, as I mentioned, in photosynthesis, this is a very common process. It's a very good enzyme for that reaction. Um, let's talk about the fuels and CO2 chemistry since we were talking about that earlier. So uh, let me go back one slide and just say this is, this cat, at least there are some really good catalysts here. Here in both directions, there's nothing great out there. There's some reasonable ones, but, but there's a lot of room for improvement. And then with these reactions involving CO2 and fuels, actually those are they're the toughest of the three. So the over potentials required to actually reduce carbon dioxide and make fuels, there's huge over potentials required. And to oxidize fuels um, in a fuel cell, for instance, if you want a methanol fuel cell or an ethanol fuel cell, you have to pay a much larger penalty here to get that reaction to go. So the overpotentials in this case are really, really big. Okay. Yes? So the overpotential depends on a lot of things. It depends on activation energies for certain, but it also depends on the kinetics of each step. And so, for instance, if you're going to oxidize methanol, and you're going to make CO2 and release six protons and six electrons in the process. Okay, alluding to the question earlier, you know, all these six electrons and protons don't all zoom in at once. Okay, we would, we would suspect that they'd come in, in batches. And do they come in batches of one or two or three is not necessarily 100% defined, but conventional thinking here is that it's one electron, one proton at a time. And so what happens is that you could end up with intermediates of methanol. Some are easy to reduce, and some are harder to reduce, and you might end up with one rate determining step. Okay, so we'll actually look at an example in the opposite direction at the end. We'll talk about this chemistry and, and how that plays out. So that's part of the framework by which I, I view catalysis. All right, let's talk about methods for a moment. So now we, we, you've seen kind of the workhorse. You've, we talked about thermodynamics. We talked about kinetics. We saw the workhorse data output, which is current versus voltage. We have a general idea of what makes a good catalyst and a bad catalyst. Basically, overpotential is the key. You want to minimize the overpotential needed. So this is how we do the measurements. Uh, we have what looks like basically a beaker. So this is called a heart-shaped electrochemical cell. More specifically, a three-electrode electrochemical cell. You don't need three electrodes to do electrochemistry. You can just take two pieces of metal, put them in water, and start doing electrochemistry. But there's a problem in doing that. And the problem is, is that although you know the delta voltage between your two electrodes, you don't know where those electrodes sit on this electrochemical series. And that can move up and down. And so this is what the purpose of a third electrode is, where this third electrode, again, we can have silver and silver plus as a redox coupler which, with a really well-defined redox potential, and we can just measure what our sample is versus that at any point in the game. We can also measure where our, what our counter electrode potential is versus this reference electrode at any point in the curve. And then, we have, then we've nailed it all down. So the three electrodes are the working electrode, which is the sample, the counter electrode, which is really serving as a current, it's, this is where the current is moving. So the current is really moving between the reference, sorry, between the working and the counter electrodes. But then voltages are measured against this reference electrode. And there's no current in an ideal world, no current going through the reference electrode. And oftentimes we'll bubble whatever species we need in solution. So if we're doing hydrogen chemistry, we're bubbling hydrogen. If we're doing oxygen chemistry, we're bubbling oxygen. And um, 
and you can choose, this can be water, it could be non-aqueous, it could be ionic liquids, it could be cyclohexane, so a lot of different variabilities for that liquid. Yeah. So there, there's two types of transport. There's transport of your reacting species getting to the electrode to do the chemistry, which is absolutely a function of the current. So at really low currents, then you know the mass transfer is going to be gr much greater than your kinetic transfer rate, so it's OK. Um, then the other question is conductivity. Your solution, you need to move ions through that solution. And so there, your solution has a resistance to it. And what is the resistance? It depends on your solution. If you're working in three molar sulfuric acid, it's pretty darn conductive. But if you're working your pH neutral conditions uh, and you know, with, net, with a few electrolyte uh, species in the solution, then you might have a large solution resistance. And then, so what, what this manifests itself into is what we call IR drop or voltage drop between the electrodes. So everything I'm saying right now, by the way, is really for aficionados in the field. Um, and basically that means if you want to know the true voltage of your sample, you need to account for how much current is flowing through your cell and what the conductivity is of your solution. And you need to, to scale for that. Yes, ma'am. Hmm? Yeah, so uh, a reference electrode, um, so this electrode could be for instance, a piece of platinum in one molar acid, because that's the standard condition, with hydrogen that's been bubbled through and with a headspace of hydrogen up here. Absolutely. So RHEs are great. Um, that's my favorite way of reporting, uh, reporting electrochemical data, because then it's, it's a nice, because a lot of electrochemical series are referenced to that point, and it's just, um, it's a very, when you interpret current voltage data, it's a really nice way to um, it's very quick and convenient for the fields that I'm talking about here for these types of chemistries. If you're working in batteries, that might ne not necessarily be the right thing you want to you want to plot against. However, there are, RHEs basically you can't really you always have to prepare them because the hydrogen will diffuse out over time. So you have to kind of make a fresh electrode every time or every few days, and that can be you know kind of a pain. And so what's easier oftentimes is to do the experiment with something like this, where you don't need it. You know, you don't need to bubble it with hydrogen. You just have a certain like three molar silver chloride in solution with a silver wire, and you know they're in equilibrium with each other. And you just, you know, you can spot check that electrode against other reference electrodes. But the point is, that's much more convenient than you can always just scale your data the way I described, because you know where this redox potential sits versus this one based on the electrochemical series. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of tricks one can play. Um, pulsing is something that's used a lot, and this is a way that you can, uh, the primary reason why people use pulsing um, is oftentimes to get away from mass transfer problems, number one. Number two, uh, it also, oftentimes you have different mechanisms at different potentials. Um, so if you want to do, for instance, you know, I did a summer internship at Boeing, and one thing I worked at at Boeing was trying to electroplate coatings onto aircraft parts to help them you know, with corrosion over the time scale of 40 years. And so sometimes you get these nooks and crannies where it's really tough to deposit. And so you want to crank up the voltage to help uh, deposit in those spots. But then if you did that, you just form a really thick layer everywhere else. So this is by doing pulsing, you can kind of just, just nucleate some growth and then relax the system and then nucleate. So, uh, so absolutely. And then in, t in terms of you know, cavitation, the problem, uh, we also have to remember there's an electric field here. And so you really have to think about what, what kind of, you know, if you're making lots of bubbles, and this is true if you're just like cranking out bubbles, making hydrogen or oxygen too, that's going to play with the electric field, which is ultimately going to, you might have hot spots on your electrode that are doing more work than others. Mm -hmm. So electrochemistry during sonication is, you know, much less defined. It's really tough to control, but it could be useful depending on an application. Yes, sir. So in an, in an ideal world, yes. But what happens is, is what happens at the electrified interface, so you've got this electrode, and you, make, you give it a cathodic or you know, anodic potential, and you're going to start piling things. You know, ions are going to move. And in the, the, the case with the CSTR is in the bulk, sure, everything will be nice and well mixed. But at that interface, you know, things are different. And it's really at the interface that counts. 
And so one of the challenges in electrochemistry is that what we can make measurements on is usually versus bulk, the bulk solution. What we don't necessarily know is what's happening in literally those first couple of nanometers. I mean, all the action happens in that first nanometer or two away from the electrode surface. So what is, if you start with a pH 5 solution in bulk, and you start doing some electrochemistry, some hydrogen evolution, let's say, you're pulling protons to the interface, you're evolving H2, you know, it's the concentration of protons at the interface that really matters, not the pH 5 of the bulk. But how do you measure something one nanometer away from the surface? So this is what a, a typical cell looks like. And then one way that is very commonly used in electrochemistry, um, one, one variant of this cell is to use what's called a rotating disk electrode. So oftentimes, so again, here's your reference and here's your counter electrode and they're hooked up to this potentiostat. A potentiostat, by the way, is just a power supply, but designed for three electrodes. So what it's designed to do is it's designed when you say, okay, I'm going to sweep the voltage to this value and to this value on my sample. You don't want to sweep that versus the counter electrode. You can do that. You can do that with a power supply if you program it. Um, what you need is some feedback where the potentiostat is sensing where this voltage is as you as you dial in a voltage and it's it's basically it's 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 uh, forcing the voltage between these two constantly sensing what's the voltage versus this and that's the feedback that's controlling your voltage sweep okay so it's sensing this voltage but it's actually dialing up a voltage between these two and then when it spits out the data it's plotting the voltage versus this reference which is nice and constant throughout the experiment so that's one point I wanted to make. So that's why you need a potential stat. Potential stats cost, you know, basically you get them on the cheap, it's about 5,000 bucks. You get really fancy ones, 20 to 30,000, just to give you, give you an idea. And then there's this rotating disk contraption where oftentimes we do run into mass transfer problems in electrocatalysis, as I mentioned. So one way around that is to rotate. You, you force some convection. So imagine your electrode uh, being basically aiming down. Imagine a disk that's totally flush as we look at this from the side. And imagine rotating this at, say, 1,600 rotations per minute. Okay? And, you know, so it's basically operating at the same speed that, that your, your, your car does. And as you do that, as you rotate this thing, you have a convective flow where you have fluid moving up towards that disk and then getting spit out the sides. And so if you're going to work on, say, you want to make a fuel cell catalyst, and you say, oh, uh, the oxygen reduction reaction in fuel cells is a major, major challenge, which is true. And, the, and you, one way you could just you can make catalysts and prepare your fuel cell and measure that in a fuel cell and see, is this a good catalyst or not? The problem is that in a fuel cell environment, there's so many things going on that you might have an amazing catalyst, but the performance of the fuel cell is bad for other reasons. And then it's tough to deconvolute. Was it my catalyst or was it something else? Or you could do things in a three electrode electrochemical cell like this, which is much better defined. And you can just put, load up different catalysts in your disk. This is what the disk would look like if we looked from underneath. And you do this measurement, and again, we're looking to reduce O2, but O2 can only, there's only so much O2 in solution here. It's again, 20, 30 parts per million. So you run into diffusion limitations really quick, unless you rotate it and you set up this really nice laminar profile with a very nice delivery of O2 to the surface. Okay, so this is very, these are very common methods used in the field. Yes? So that's another hydrodynamic method that could be used, absolutely. So there's basically any way that you can move species to the surface. And so the rotating disk is fine. You can also have impinging jet um, where you're just like shooting a jet and, and it, it again comes off the side. You could have a flow, just a, a planar flow moving over an electrode surface. So. Okay, so we talked about methods, we talked about kinetics, we talked about thermodynamics. Let's get to this very important question of what are the primary figures of merit in catalysis. So these are the big ones. These are for any, any catalyst in any reaction, any industry, you always care about how active it is, how selective it is to make the products that you're interested in, and how stable it is over time. So my question to you is, which of these is most critically needed in catalyst development? What do you guys think? Who wants to, to take a guess at this? <laughs> it really is all of the above. You do need, yeah, this is, this is what we want right about there. <laughs> yeah, so um, although we do need these things to, be, to make it a commercially viable process, every reaction has different needs in the sense that, that some catalysts, 
it's easier to get selectivity than activity, or it's easier to get activity than selectivity, or it's easier to get stability than, and so you kind of, every reaction has like a different starting point, if you will, which basically defines, you know, what are the needs for that re reaction? Like, where do we need to push materials research? So the real question in electrochemical reaction kinetics is how much current do I achieve for the amount of overpotential that I apply? So this is a measure of activity. So you want as much current as you can get as close to the equilibrium potential as you can. The further from equilibrium means the more you have to overdrive the system, which means you're, you're putting more energy in or getting less energy out if it's an energy generation technology. So how much current you get out really depends on two major factors. As with any chemical reaction, there's the inherent kinetics and then there's the effects of mass transfer. So we already talked about mass transfer. I won't go into the details of that, um, but I do wanna go into a little bit more details on the inherent kinetics of the reaction. This is the workhorse equation that describes reaction kinetics in electrocatalysis. This is known as the Butler-Volmer equation. And as you can see, there's a lot of terms here. And, and so if this, you're seeing this for the first time, I just want you at least to get a sense for what's important. And the way this equation is constructed, there's really constructed into two parts. Uh, note that there's exponential functionalities on both sides. The way this reaction is written, it's, it's basically agnostic as to whether it's a reduction reaction or um, an oxidation reaction that's occurring. It actually throws both of these terms, that's what these two terms are. It's basically a balance between the anodic side and the cathodic side. The further away you are from equilibrium in one direction or the other, then one of these terms will cancel out and you just end up with the one that matters for, for that case. Okay, but I'm showing you in, in expanded, expanded view. And so what are we looking at? So this I is the current density that you get out. This I naught is known as the exchange current density. And the definition of the exchange current density is how much current is going backwards and forwards simultaneously when it's at equilibrium. Okay, Any, as I mentioned, when you have an electrode that's sitting at that equilibrium potential, it means backwards and forwards are going at the same rate. But it doesn't mean that all materials have the same backwards and forwards rate. Okay, presumably a good catalyst will have a huge massively reductive current going and a massively huge oxidation current going and it ends up being zero is what you measure. But that must be a good catalyst compared to one where it's really slow to the left and really slow to the right. Okay, so that's known as the exchange current density. This is oftentimes plotted, that's oftentimes that's how catalysts are ranked, is based on their exchange current density. And then little n here is the same little n we had before of number of electrons transferred. Alpha is known as the transfer coefficient, and there's a lot of details that can be said about that. I'll get back to that in a moment. F is the same Faraday's constant we talked about before. And then here's really the important one, eta. Eta is what we call the overpotential. Again, this is how far away you are from equilibrium. And so really what this, and R and T are just the gas constant and temperature. So one way you can look at this equation is that N is number of electrons, so that's gonna be specific for a given reaction. F is a constant, that's Faraday's constant. R and T, you know, the R is a constant, temperature is, is whatever it is for your system. So really, all these four values are fixed. And then you have these alpha, these transfer coefficients. These are basically, for you aficionados out there, is describing if you're going, it's, it's what the potential energy curves or surfaces look like as you change the voltage of your system. And that inter, where, how they cross describes the symmetry of electrons going one direction versus another. And that's all, all those physics are wrapped up into a nice, convenient, tidy alpha. So we don't, I don't wanna say too much more beyond that. That would be a, another level of discussion, but um, the point is alpha is a constant for a given electrochemical reaction. So what it really means is that the current is gonna be exponentially related to this overpotential, how far you are from equilibrium. That's really the main point of what this equation is saying. And so that's why I said, notice that, so this eta, so if you have, as I described it, it's, it's E minus E equilibrium. So if you're to the positive side of E equilibrium, then eta is a positive value. And if eta is a positive value, then that means you have a negative of a positive value. So that means as you go more and more positive, then this term is gonna disappear because it's exponential to a large negative number. Whereas this one is gonna inflate. And that's what I was saying, that one term will end up dominating over the other. If E, where you're measuring your potential, is negative of equilibrium, um, is smaller than E equilibrium, then you have a negative over potential, which means that this term is the one that's gonna go huge, and then this term is going to disappear. 
So you have this anodic term and cathodic term. The total current you measure is going to be I anodic plus I cathodic. And if you're near equilibrium, both terms count. If you're far from equilibrium, one of the terms vanishes. And so, by the way, this all assumes that only one step is rate determining. So this Butler-Volmer equation, as helpful as it is for us to describe electrocatalyst kinetics, it rarely fits your data. Okay? It rarely does. But it's a good framework to think about it. You have a question? Yeah, I'm wondering, your student talked yesterday yes. with the dilemma of the CO solution. Yes. Where does that come in here? I'll, I'll get to that, actually. I'll get to exactly that example in a bit. Yes? Uh, I must have missed something here. The, the, the electrons are the same number of electrons that I thought, why are you adding them together? So uh, you mean, in this case, why are we adding them? So, so think of it as, um, let's see here. There we go. I'll skip, I'll go back to that to just to finish the thought, but to answer your question. So here's, if I were to take the Butler-Volmer equation and just plug in values and plot it on Excel, it would look something like this in the, in the solid line. Okay, you see, you can tell it has this exponential shape on both sides. You can tell that it crosses zero because backwards and forwards at equilibrium equals zero. Okay. Now, if you had just grabbed one term or the other, the cathodic or the anodic, and just plotted those, you get the dashed lines. Okay. And if you sum them up, you would, you would get this, this black line. Now, the point that I'm trying to make here is that if you're near equilibrium, then you cannot discount one term or the other because the over potentials are so small, even though you have an e to the negative number, that's such a small negative, that it's, it's, still a, uh, it's still on the same order of magnitude as your other term. But if you get further and further from equilibrium, then you can see the dashed line and the solid line converge because the other term goes to zero. So that's why. So on that note, this actually is very helpful having said that, that you know, if, we just, if you're far from equilibrium, now we've all seen that only one term dominates, this is a much, much simpler way to express the Butler-Volmer equation and this is known as the Toffel equation. Toffel came up with this relationship in, I think it was 1905, very shortly after Arrhenius came up with a very similar looking type of rate expression for a standard thermochemical reaction. So it's very interesting, although they did this independently. Um, and so what you've done here is we've basically wrapped up all these parameters here that are constants or, or based on the given experimental conditions into this little b. And so for an anodic current, it's just your exchange current times this exponential to the eta over b and your cathodic current is minus the exchange current density times the exponential to the minus eta over b. Much, much more simplified expression. So what this is getting at here is if you want to measure, if you want to rank catalysts, okay, figures of merit, the two very common things that people will report are what is your exchange current density or what is your Tafel slope, b. And, and what you want is a high exchange current density because you want, again, fast catalyst kinetics backwards and forwards at equilibrium means that it should be fast if you go high over potential one way or the other. And then this B, you want a small B, a small B which is usually reported in millivolts per decade if, it's, if we're going to use a, log, a base 10 scale, which means how many millivolts do I need to, to move to move this up an order of magnitude, to move the current up an order of magnitude if we're on a base 10 scale. So getting back to these figures of merit, and so yeah, so this is what the Tafel, so if you were to get real current versus voltage data, it might look something like this. And what you can do is you can basically fit your data that's far from equilibrium with either of these Tafel expressions. You'll get a straight line when you plot it on a log scale, and that intersection here is log of your exchange current density, and then this will give you your Tafel slope. So this brings us to what are the four primary figures of merit used in electrocatalysis research. You've got exchange current density, um, which is one thing. You've got Toffel slope, we just talked about. And then these are very, very practical ways of doing it. You can measure how much current density do you get at a given over potential. Okay, so if I want to know 0.1 volts away, 0.2 volts away, 0.3 volts away, how much current do I get, that's one way to do it. Or you could say, I need a certain current density. I need one amp per square centimeter. I need 10 milliamps per square centimeter then this tells you how many millivolts you need to get there. Okay, now one of the tricks here in electrocatalyst research is that you notice that a lot of these terms have a per square centimeter. 
And yes, you could just use the area of your electrode that you see immersed, but anyone who works in catalysis knows that what really counts is your surface area, your true surface area. So this complicates things. So the question is, how do you report current densities? So one way you can do it is per geometric area. This is the simplest way to do it. Again, you can't go wrong there in a sense. You're just reporting versus that's a very easily measurable thing. Uh, but what you'd really like to get is, is per surface area, which is a lot harder. In, in gas on surface type of catalysis with powders, you do BET measurements, voila, you can get those, those numbers pretty well. But in electrocatalysis, these are, you know, these are on electrode surfaces. So these are, you know, it's, you can't just put that into a BET analyzer and scraping it off. Uh, there's issues. We can talk about that later. But that's a really hard thing to get. But then what you really want is actually not even this. What you really want is electrochemically active surface area. There might be parts of your surface that are, for instance, not even electrically connected. So even if you did know your true surface area, that doesn't mean it's electrically connected to the solution and doing the work. So what you'd really like to get is your electrochemically active surface area. And then that's the closest thing you can use to get to a true catalyst turnover frequency, which is what we want to say one catalyst is better than another. And the, the point I want to make here is that as we go, this is easy and very practical, but not quite as useful. This is extremely useful, but very challenging to get. Okay, so those are kind of your options. So when, when, we, when we write our, when we report our data, we, we do our very best to get all the way to this level. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. A couple questions, yeah. This points out something I've wondered about in terms of electrocatalysis versus regular catalysis. Do you have to be either an order of magnitude more active for electrocatalysis to get, say, the volumetric activity, say, if you're actually to, to build something? Mm -hmm. Because this is a, uh, an area, that, whereas with regular catalysis, it's a yeah, so electrochemical devices generally do need more space to get you the same amount of product, if that's what you're getting at, absolutely. Or, high, or higher activity, yeah. But, and then, but then you also have, you know, because electrochemistry oftentimes happens either in, with solid-solid junctions or solid-liquid junctions, as opposed to gases, which can flow through super porous materials without a problem, then it's oftentimes tougher to achieve the same kind of volumetric activity. So rea electrochemical reactor design is a really important part of this if you want to scale it up industrially. Absolutely. And there's another question behind. Yes? Yeah, so if you look at a polarization curve for a fuel cell, it's a region where you have concentration of polarization. And you can model that in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. Usually it's empirical, but you can get rid of the empiricism by putting in a fundamental mass transport resistance. Sure. Mm -hmm. Is butler Bomer fundamental, like a dusty gas model for, for, for mass transport, but for uh, electrocatalytic mechanisms, so to speak? So the equation that I presented here, there's absolutely no mass transfer terms reported, right? There's a, nothing in here is mass transfer, so one would have to, yeah. Is it fundamental the way a dusty gas model is fundamental for mass transport or? Uh, so this is, this is absolutely fundamental. This is basically a first principles way of looking at catalyst kinetics. Yeah. So there's no, there's no um, empiricism in here except for, I would say, um, the alpha that's in here, you know, that, that is oftentimes kind of reported as a measurement experimentally, um, but... So there's two ways to look at it. Either TAFL comes from this, which like I said is, is not empirical, there's no empiricism in here, or you can extract these parameters from your data. So it can go either way. Okay, so um, I want to move on to some applications in the last few minutes here. And just to recap where we're at, we've, we've talked about thermal, we've talked about kinetics, we've talked about methods, we've talked about these important figures of merit for electrocatalyst development. Again, different ways of reporting activities. And if for anyone in the room who's interested in solar fuels, the important figure of metric, I think, amongst these four that we talked about is really this one. How much over potential do you need to reach 10 milliamps per square centimeter? And the reason why I say that is because if you just did the calculation with the AM 1.5 radiation, the solar flux, and you said, let's say I have a 10% efficient device at capturing these solar photons and doing something with it, then you would generate about 10 milliamps per geometric square centimeter because that's how many photons are coming down. And so, so then how much over potential you need to reach that current density is what I think is a nice way to rank catalysts. In the end, there's no substitute 
in my book for having the raw data in front of you. There's just no substitute for actually looking at all your, your current voltage curves and then stacking them up, but that's kind of an, it's an, a cumbersome way if you're comparing lots of different catalysts. If you want to compare 100 catalysts, that would be a nightmare. But if you just say, hey, I'm just going to report one number, how much over potential do I need to get me the 10 million per square centimeter, then I can at least start looking at the ranking very quickly and easily. So with that, now that we've looked at the fundamentals, let's, as I promised, let's try to apply some of the things that we learned to looking at two examples, one of making hydrogen and one of reducing carbon dioxide. So talking about the experimental methodology, just recapping here, remember that we have three electro electrochemical cells. There's many ways that you can build these things and, uh, and run your three electrode experiment. At the end of the day, what you're doing is you're measuring current versus voltage. And it, we want to know how much current are we getting for the over potential that we're putting into the system. So what you're looking at here is some real data on the catalyst we've made. Here's your potential scale voltage versus the reversible hydrogen. So at zero, the electrodes are everything's at equilibrium backwards and forwards. As we go to the left or the cathodic side, we're going to favor reduction. On the bare glassy carbon disk, which is our support for the catalyst, you see there's no current, thus no activity. When we put a molysulfide catalyst on, we can see we're making lots of hydrogen. Okay, so that's kind of the data that we're doing. And then we're going to take that data and you can construct a TOEFL plot. Here's a TOEFL plot of a bunch of usual suspects out there for hydrogen evolution catalysis in acid and in base. And what we're looking at is how much current do you get out of the system for the amount of over potential that you pay. And so what you want are catalysts that are in this corner that have low over potential and high current densities. Okay? Not surprisingly, lots of precious metals. Um, rainy nickel works really well in base, but not in, in uh, neutral or acid solutions. And so the question is, can we, now the problem is, is if we want an acid, a catalyst that works in acid that's non-precious metal, you know, what can we make that is possibly close to the precious metals? And so what I'd like to do is just show you, you know, a framework for thinking about catalysts and how they work now that we've learned the fundamentals. And so we're looking at a molecular scale picture of hydrogen evolution reaction. And this reaction is, like I said, it's about as simple as it gets. You have two protons plus two electrons going to H2. And there's two mechanisms that one can one can imagine. There's a volmer tafel mechanism, which is akin to langmuir hinchelwood in conventional catalysis, and there's volmer hedowski which is uh, akin to Ely riedel And so let's look at the volmer tafel mechanism first. We can imagine you have a liquid sitting atop your catalyst surface, and some protons. The first proton comes down, accepts an electron. There's your first electron transfer. You make an adsorbed hydrogen ad atom. That's the volmer step. You can imagine repeating that. Now you've got two hydrogen ad atoms sitting that are mobile on the surface, they'll move around until they find each other, form molecular H2 and desorb. Okay, that's the volmer tafel mechanism. The volmer hedowski mechanism starts exactly the same way by forming this adsorbed hydrogen ad atom. But now, instead of this proton coming down and doing a volmer step, it's going to do the hedowski step, which is abstracting that first hydrogen as it accepts an electron to make the H2. And the point that I want to make here is that either way you go, and believe me, this is hugely contentious in the literature, what is the mechanism happening on a given surface? People have been looking into this for decades on well-defined platinum single crystals, and still to this day, 2012, controversy, what is the mechanism? But if you want to make a good catalyst, you don't necessarily need to know the mechanism in this case, because you'll notice that both of them have the exact same reactive intermediate sitting on a surface. You still have this adsorbed hydrogen. And if you're really clever about it, you might say, I don't want to. I don't want to bind this hydrogen too tightly nor too weakly. If I bind it really tight, these things will never want to recombine and make H2. And if it's too tight, this hydrogen is not going to want to come off as H2 when another proton comes in. And if it's too weak, then you won't get those protons down in the first place, so then it can't even act as a catalyst. So you want to have a moderate binding energy. So this is a manifestation of what's known as the, the Sabatier principle in catalysis. So Paul Sabatier said in 1911, so he won the Nobel Prize in 1912, but not for this. Um, for other chemistry, he shared it with Grignard that year. But he said an optimal catalyst will bind reaction intermediates moderately on the surface, not too strongly nor too weakly. And then about 50 years later, Roger Parsons drew what I call the first, the first volcano I've ever seen in electrocatalysis. It's a hand-drawn figure where he basically predicted that activity should, should be best with catalysts that exhibit a delta G of hydrogen adsorption close to zero. So not too strongly nor too weakly. Skip ahead another 50 years. And then now there's a theoretical framework to quantify, to make a quantitative volcano of electrocatalysis. So this is some work that uh, was spearheaded theoretically by Jens Norsko at the Technical University of Denmark. He's going to give a talk later this afternoon using a lot of these concepts. Um, we work together quite a bit now that he's at Stanford. 
And what we're plotting here is the exchange current density for a number of different catalyst materials for hydrogen. Okay, higher is better. And we're plotting it versus a DFT calculated delta GH. So DFT is now allowing us to quantify this hydrogen adsorption step. How tight or how weak is that? And we're plotting up data. This is coming from about 50 years worth of research in the field from different labs all over the world. And remarkably, all this data follows this volcano-shaped trend. And as I mentioned earlier, the top of the volcano, guess what? A bunch of precious metal catalysts that all have this delta G close to zero. So the bad news is that, OK, so the good news is that we have this nice framework that quantify. You now we have a quantitative volcano. We can actually do these calculations. The bad news is that we still realize that there's all these precious metals at the top. But now we can at least ask the question, can we do calculations on other surfaces and maybe figure out ones that have a delta G close to zero? And if they do, they should be good catalysts. Okay, so this is one way to think about making better catalysts. So one way you can go about this is a bio-inspired approach in which Jens and co-workers had done calculations on enzymes. As I mentioned, hydrogenase is very good at making hydrogen. Nitrogenase is very good at making hydrogen. That was known experimentally, certainly. They did the calculations on the active sites or on the best models of active sites at the time uh, and showed that the delta G of hydrogen adsorption is indeed very close to zero. So that explains why the nature was able to come up with such good catalysts. The really interesting thing is take a look at the mix of elements. There's nothing precious metal in there. So nature came up with a way to basically emulate platinum without platinum. So what can we learn? How can we, do, how can we use this as a design principle to make a solid state analog of an enzyme? And so it turns out that you can see the active sites here in nitrogenase. This is sulfur that's doing the work. That sulfur is coordinated to two metals. And the sulfurs up here, which are coordinated to three metals, aren't doing anything. So there's something about undercoordinated sulfur. And I know there's several of you in the room who are aware of uh, hydrotreating in the petrochemical industry. Molysulfide is a major catalyst used in, that, in those industrial scale processes. And molysulfide is a layered compound, looks a lot like graphite. Okay, so it's these sheets of molysulfide where you've got each sheet consists of a, a sandwich of Molly and sulfur. So this is sulfur, molly, sulfur, tri-layer slabs that will stack by van der Waals forces on top of each other. <clears throat> the calculations show that the sulfurs up here shouldn't do anything for hydrogen, but it turns out that the edge sulfur has a delta G that's very close to zero. So this was predicted by theory to be a good catalyst for hydrogen. And in fact, the group at DTU had shown this, that nano, nanoparticulate molly sulfide with lots of edge sites are good catalysts. And when I went there as a postdoc, one of the questions that we aim to answer is, is it truly the edges, though, that are doing the work? And so what we did is we synthesized very well-defined nanoparticles of molysulfide. These are kind of in the 5 nanometer range, sitting on top of a gold 111 single crystal. We would made all the particles in vacuum to the STM in vacuum. Then we withdrew them from vacuum, now that we knew what their size and shape and number of edges were, and we did electrochemistry. And as you can see here, these catalysts were very active for hydrogen evolution because you only have to go about 0.1 volts over potential. And you can see that the, there's an onset for hydrogen, which is a very active catalyst and non-precious metal. And, and in fact, then, so not only did we see that these are really active catalysts because it had lots of edges, then we asked the question, well, does the activity scale with surface area or does it scale with the edge perimeter length? And so we did that calculation. And as you can see from this data here, this is plotting. I'm not showing you the one versus area, which is totally a mess. But when you, when you plot versus edge length, all these dots just fall on a line, which tells you that activity, in fact, scales linearly with the number of edge sites that you have, which is confirmation that the theory was right. Okay? So this framework of looking at catalysis in this way is very powerful to making better catalysts. And in fact, we've taken this a few steps further. In my lab here at Stanford, we've basically made a family of, of nanostructured molysulfides. Now that we know what the active site is, we can make lots of different nanostructures. We've made nanowires. We've made mesoporous materials. Um, and as you can see, this is the same Toffel plot I was showing you earlier, but for, for acid samples. And for if you, if in acid, you still can't beat the precious metals. But we're getting the molysulfide closer and closer to the best precious metal catalyst and much, much better than the, the, non the other non-precious materials out there. I should also say that molysulfide is extremely stable in acid. So we've done lots of stability tests there as well. So it's a, as stable as platinum to the best of our measurements, literally tens of thousands of cyclical tamograms. So this is kind of where hydrogen evolution catalyst development stands. Precious metals are the best, but of course they're expensive. 
Common metals are inexpensive, but they're not very active. If you're working in base, it turns out the nickel alloys work really well, but they're completely unstable in acid. And molysulfides are really good in acids. They're unstable in base. Bottom line is we have some reasonable candidates for hydrogen catalysts now. Yes, sir? Yeah, so I mean, what it comes down to is thermodynamics of pH. Basically, there's, uh, you know, for, for everyone in the room, there's, these, um, there's an atlas called the Poor Bay Atlas. And so uh, these Poor Bay diagrams plot the thermodynamically stable phases of materials as a function of the pH and potential. And so, of course, the thermal chemistry for every material is going to be different under these different conditions. And um, the mechanisms by which corrosion occurs, we can talk about that offline, but the bottom line is, is that every material has their kind of stable region based on what's the most thermodynamically stable phase at that condition. So molysulfide remains a molysulfide under when you're at these negative potentials and um, under, uh, so under reducing conditions and in acid, but if you went in base, you would oxidize, the base would oxidize the molysulfide to make an, a molyoxide or hydroxide. Um, let's talk about uh, the last example here of CO2 reduction and, and the challenges here. And so again, we looked at the redox potentials before, but let's, let's look at the methanation process. Pretend we have protons and electrons to work with. We don't want them to make hydrogen. We want to stick them onto CO2 to make methane instead. Okay, let's say that's what we want to do. Here's the challenge that we're facing. So here's some simulations from Jens again and, and his former postdoc, Andy Peterson, who's now a professor at Brown. And imagine a CO2 molecule coming down. You need to transfer one proton and electron you make a carboxy group. A second proton and electron, you, you protonate this OH to make water, and you leave a CO behind. You protonate that to make HCO, again to make formaldehyde, again to make methoxy. Notice that the methoxy is sticking up in this calculation. So if you're, the next proton and electron to come in, it's gotta, it's, it can have two choices, hit down low or hit up high. If it hits down low, you make methanol. If it hits up high, you make methane. We talked about making methane. So let's hit it up high. You make your methane. You leave an oxygen behind, which you need to hit with two more protons and electrons to make H2O clean the surface, and you're back to square one. And this is the problem with multi-step reactions. This is the problem when you're trying to make larger molecules. You have all these steps. If, they, if, all, if all eight electrons and protons zoomed in at the same time, it would be easier. But that's not how kinetics work. So it's more usually one step at a time. And remember that Sabaté volcano that we had developed for hydrogen? Imagine a Sabaté volcano where you have to think about each and every one of these intermediates on the way. And if you want a catalyst that can do methane production near the equilibrium potential, remember, by thermodynamics, this reaction is just about as easy as this one to drive. They're very, very similar. But now you have to go through all these steps. The only way you're going to operate near that equilibrium potential is if you have a catalyst surface that can do each and every one of these steps without binding each of these reaction intermediates too tightly nor too weakly. And that's a tough thing to design. What makes it even harder is a lot of the, the binding relationships here scale with one another. So for instance, um, your CO and your carboxy, they both bind through the carbon. So if you, need to, if you need to tighten this and weaken that, that's a really hard thing to do. Because if you tighten the bond to this, you're probably going to tighten the bond to that. So there's a lot of scaling relations for catalyst surfaces. So we're probably going to need, to make a good catalyst for this reaction, we're probably going to need um, something, more, uh, something more complex than a, a simple metal surface. So one more technical slide, and then we'll conclude. Um, my student, Kendra, gave a talk about electroreduction products on copper. And just based on the framework that I just presented on the previous slide, maybe it's a little bit clearer now why it is that when we do CO2 reduction on copper, we see so many different products. And that's where selectivity control becomes an issue because when you, because when you have to operate at the potentials that, that copper needs to do CO2 reduction, you're minus a volt over potential, then everything becomes thermodynamically favorable. And so it's really tough to have selectivity under those situations. So that's yet another, another challenge I wanted to, to bring up. So let's summarize. Um, so we talked about the role of electrocatalysis, how it relates to energy conversion, and it's how it fits within other camps of catalysis. We went through the electrochemistry fundamentals, anodes, cathodes, redox chemistry, equilibrium potentials, and reaction energetics. We talked about kinetics via the Butler-Vollmer and Toffel equation, and very importantly, the primary figures of merit in determining catalyst activity. 
So now those of you who knew very little about electric catalysis going to the room, now you can read a, science, a research paper, any research paper in catalysis, in electric catalysis, and start thinking, is that a good catalyst or not? Ask yourself, how much current are you getting close to the equilibrium potential? And, and how much better is that versus another catalyst? And of course, you'd like to plot up all everyone from uh, in the fields, different current voltage curves, but that becomes unwieldy. So maybe you want to think about other figures of merit, like exchange current density, or how much over potential do I need to get a certain current density out of my, my system? We talked about methods in electric, uh, electric catalysis research. Um, and then we looked at these two examples. And I'd like to uh, really conclude with some references, some further reading, if you're interested. I mean, there's a lot actually in electrochemistry that you'll find online that I think is very helpful because there's a lot of animations and visualization one can do. But if you're looking for something a little more kind of solid and concrete and standard in the field, uh, the book by Bard and Faulkner, Electrochemical Methods, is, is definitely the, the biggest hit in the field. Um, this is one of my favorites is Bakris and Kahn, Surface Electrochemistry and Molecular Level Approach. A lot of good stuff in there. And then John Newman at Berkeley wrote a beautiful book called Electrochemical Systems. It's really much more of the engineering side of things. So how to do modeling and, and devices and um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of things as an engineer that you won't find in, in these textbooks, which are more on the chemistry side. And the very last thing I want to say is um, if you're interested in learning more about solar fuels, just literally three months ago, I finished completing a four-hour online lecture course through Stanford Center for Professional Development. So, and this solar fuels course will I cover a lot of things that you saw today from the electric catalyst point of view, but then I go into a lot of the semiconductor point of view, and I talk a lot about techno-economics and uh, kind of needs in the field, and so it's a much more expansive version of what you saw here related to solar fuels. So just want to put that on your radar screen if you're interested. And with that, I thank you all very much for the discussion and for the attention, and I know we don't have a whole lot more time, but I'll stick around if you have questions. So thank you all very much. Yes, sir. Is this uh, course downloadable, or do you sign up for it? I think, it, yeah, you sign up for it. So um, I've never signed up for an SCP course myself, but um, I think you basically have to log on. Anyone can take it from around the world. You just need online access. Um, Stanford students, I believe there's no charge, but for non-Stanford affiliated folks, I think there is a charge. Is this one of the uh, module for the energy? It is. That's right. So this is part of a, so you can either do it on as a standalone course, but it's also part of a certificate program that Stanford just recently started up. So um, E and myself and oops, and Mike McGee and a few others uh, put together these modules in energy. So they're all so E did one on batteries, Mike did one on solar cells, and um, there's other technologies that are in there too. So there, you can actually get a certificate um, uh, in I can't remember what it's called, but it's energy and something else, energy technology, and, and so this is part of that. They're all kind of three to four hour lecture modules. Yes, sir. I was left with a question on acids and bases. Mm -hmm. So I understood how certain things work better with one or the other. Mm -hmm. But do you have a preference or you don't care? Or? Yeah, so my preference is to be on one extreme or the other. But in the middle, things get really tricky. So, um, and, and part, there's a lot of reasons for that. The, the simple reason is that when you're operating at one end or the other, um, two things happen. Number one, you get good electrolyte conductivity, which is very important. Um, the other thing is it's a more defined scenario. In other words, if you're near neutral, your electrode could swing into a basic environment, it could swing into an acidic environment, and there's, you know, it's less defined. Um, whereas if you're at pH 13, you, you could get swings, but pH 11, pH 14 are still, for the most part, the same type of interface. But um, if you're at, say, pH 7, and, and you might end up with an acidic or where you have lots of H pluses near the interface, if you're in the basic, you have a lot of OH minuses, that could actually change the physics of what's happening there. So that's just kind of a, from somebody who likes to think about things molecularly, that becomes really, really tricky. In terms of scale up, I mean, uh, you know, we're, society and, and engineers, we're really good at, at making systems that can last in both environments. So that's not, so as long as the catalyst survives, I'm not worried about the balance of plant, if you will. I mean, that's certainly achievable. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, one of the real problems in fuel cell catalysis is the oxygen electrode, which is a very large total potential. Now, I would think that that's a relatively simple reaction, you know, O2 coming down and coming off two waters, but it is four electrons. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not as complicated as the multi step. The CO2. But it, it's, it's, yeah, it, it basically comes down to the exact same problem. So as I mentioned, of the three reactions we kind of talked about, there was hydrogen, there was water O2 chemistry, there was CO2 chemistry in fuels. 
And I mentioned that hydrogen is kind of the easiest because it's only got two electrons and two protons and one reactive intermediate. Um, CO2 is the hardest because you've got all these different reactive intermediates and all these different steps. And then the O2, H2O chemistry is in between. And so it's not surprising that the O2 and H2O catalysts are worse than the hydrogen ones, but better than the CO2 uh, for the, exactly this reason. And, you, and even though it's only four steps, you run into this problem that I was, I was alluding to before, and I'm happy to give you plenty of references on this. Um, and in fact, in my solar fuels course, I, I talk about it head on. But there's the volcano curve, if you will, once it, the way the thermodynamics works out is that if you have an O2 molecule coming down, that O2, you protonate it, you make an OOH species. Okay? You protonate it again, then the OH becomes water and floats away. Now you have O, which you have to protonate two more times. And as it turns out, the OH, which is one of the intermediates sitting on the surface, and the OOH, which are at two different points in the reaction, um, they bind to the catalyst surface in a very similar manner where if you, in some cases, you want to tighten the bond to one but weaken it to the other, or you tighten this one and weaken the other. But as I mentioned, because they're both bonded, it's basically a metal oxygen bond with very similar character. It's tough to make a catalyst surface where you can accomplish both. It's like you either tighten both or you weaken both. And so the simplest way I could describe the problem in that reaction is that those two things are tethered to one another and there could very well be a different class of materials that could be developed where you don't need to tune both because they're both just at the right binding energy that you'd like it to be. And that's really the challenge in that field. So there's different approaches. You can either make a surface that binds them just right, or you can think about throwing a third party involved, which kind of bonds to one selectively versus the other. And then it starts looking a little bit more like an enzyme. So this is kind of, you know, when I was plotting these, these five different ways of viewing catalysts, this is, this is kind of a source of inspiration is, can you use a ligand in somewhere that will interact with one absorbed intermediate differently from another? And that's one way that you can stabilize and destabilize that has nothing to do with the catalyst surface per se. So that's the challenge in a nutshell. Okay, I think, yes, we have to wrap things up. I'll stick around for a few minutes if you guys have any more questions. Thanks again. Thanks again.